Hey, good morning. All right, so uh, love doing this stuff. This is this is awesome. Getting up in the morning, getting the coffee ready, lighting my candle, opening up the Word, and and meeting with all of you uh, to to begin to put things in the proper context. You know, we we've got to get up and we've got to get after this week, but we don't want to we don't want to do it chasing our tails and and chasing after the wind, as Solomon would put it in Ecclesiastes. Uh, we, we don't want to uh, chase phantoms and the like. We want to be uh, about the, the truth. And so we, we need to see things as they actually are, and we want to just not just look at them as the world tells us we should look at them, but as the creator of the world puts them into the context through his word, the proper context. So we're going to look at, at that today. And actually, we're going to uh, tackle a, a great topic today. The topic that we're going to go after today is um, is the topic of truth. And, and you've probably seen some of these things appear uh, in, in the news cycle lately or over the last couple of years. I mean, it seems like we've been hearing this phrase for probably... I'm going to say the last six, seven years seems like it really picked up, picked up pace. Uh, but have you ever saw that, heard that phrase, fake, fake news? Um, and then you, you hear all the uh, fact checkers. That's another phrase, the fact checkers that are out there trying to make sure that we know the facts and that people aren't just passing off their propaganda and filling us full of lies. And which is a good, a good thing if you could, in fact trust the fact checkers but so often we know that people put things in the context that they want you to understand it that's why we have to go to God's word and we have to put it within the context that he gives it to us and see that everyone has their own perspective but doesn't necessarily adequately represent the truth so they, they kind of put their own and this is another word that's oftentimes used spin there's a lot of spin going on out there, and so we want to understand what that uh, what that spin looks like when we really investigate it under the microscope of God's word. Here's another one. Uh, let's let's take a close up look at this one here. Um, look at this. You've probably heard disinformation. Did you realize that the difference between the way that these are these are given to us? Disinformation. False and misleading information deliberately spread. Uh, or misinformation. This is where a person just kind of makes a mistake and they accidentally say something out of line, but it takes off, it goes viral on Facebook or something like that. And so this is misinformation. We're just something, someone's getting it wrong. Uh, false and misleading, misleading information inadvertently spread. And then you have malinformation. This is like this is like your malware that's going to infect your computer and is going to cause you all sorts of headaches and everything because it uh, causes creates conflicts in the programming and stuff like that. So you get the malinformation. That's information with a basis in reality, but spread specifically to cause harm. So it's malicious information. It's intended to cause harm, and and uh, we want to be aware of when that's happening. And this is why I said, uh, I've said in the past, you know, it, no matter whether you're you're a Republican or a Democrat, you really be, have to be on, on your guard. Because when you're talking politics, uh, people become uh, very malicious uh, against the opposing view. And I don't know that I've ever heard it quite as strongly as I have uh, in recent years, the idea of being enemies uh, to one another. So uh, it used to be just different ways to come at a problem. Uh, and I'm not sure that it's, it's accurate even to say this has never been like this in all of history, the divisiveness that we see among our politicians. Uh, because I, I look back on history, I see some very divided times. Uh, so I, I don't know that we've not been here before. In fact, I think once again, Solomon would say it well, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, so the idea that, that Brutus uh, Caesar didn't get 
stabbed in the back, you know, didn't get assassinated. These assassinations, have, I mean, there have been enemies all along. So we got to be on our guard, uh, regardless of what our political persuasion may be. Uh, and really, we should never allow the, the politics of the day to usurp God's word. And so that always puts things in the context in which we really want to reside. That's where we want to make our home, is in his word and looking at the world as it is. And what, what does that teach us right from the very beginning? If we go back to Genesis and we look at chapter 3 and we see the fall into sin, we realize that, hey, you know, this world that we're living in, this, this uh, context that we are placed in, is one of fallenness and, and sin. And so the truth is we're all sinners. The truth is I am a poor, miserable sinner. And I, I don't just confess that on Sunday. I acknowledge that every day of the week. And part of that acknowledgement that I appreciate, this, uh, this is one of the great things that I enjoy in my, my faith, is the more I t tell God what a bad person I am, the, the, the greater and more accessible I am to his mercy. And so it's not that I want to be the worst, the chief of sinners, but that's what Paul made himself out to be. And in so doing, he made himself more accessible to the grace of God. For in his weakness, God's grace found its sufficiency. And uh, his grace is our strength. Uh, by his grace, we are made strong. So we want to keep hold of that truth. We don't want to deny that. We don't want to just make excuses for our shortcomings or our fallibility. We want to tr try and improve where, where we are. We want to follow where God would lead. Uh, but when we stray and we wander and we, we uh, find ourselves in this sinful condition, we acknowledge that, we repent of that, we turn away from that, and we turn toward our God who promises to save us. Now, that all being said, we, we're, the context is we are living in a sinful world. We are living outside of paradise, and we need a Savior. But not everyone shares that same context. When we look at truth, it's not just a difference of politics. It's not just a right or a left issue. The issue of truth has, has also come to this point where, uh, let's transition back here a little bit, uh, this idea of of truth has become an issue of personal truth you know uh it's true that's what's true for me you know that's you know be true to yourself and you you have to understand your own truth you know and so we're getting away from the idea that that truth is truth is truth it, there there's one now there's certain things that we can have our own personal opinions on but we shouldn't confer, confuse an opinion or personal persuasion toward an absolute truth. Uh, this is just the reality of it. Uh, here's one of the realities. We could not exist on this planet if there were not a sun in the sky. That's an absolute truth of natural science. Now, it's not an absolute truth with regard to God can do whatever he wants. So if he wants us to, if he would have created us without a sun in the sky and just let it stand, let there be light and made us exist apart from the sun the con uh, and the moon and the stars and all those uh, heavenly cosmic lights, then that would have been his will and he would have done it. He's, that's, that's his. And then we would have different natural laws. But as the natural laws exist, the absolute truth is that sun is kind of a necessity to our existence and survival in this human uh, frame that we're in. So uh, let's look at that. So here's a here's another. Let's see. I want to um, today. I want to talk about truth, which is the elephant in the room. So here's a here's a little uh, glance at that. Pull that back up here and big screen here for us. The elephant in the room. The elephant is in the room is the truth that nobody wants to talk about. So everybody knows it's there, but nobody wants to address it. That's the, that's the truth. 
okay? So the truth is the elephant in the room is the truth that nobody wants to talk about, uh, but still is there. We're just ignoring it. So we, we try to imagine that it blends in with the wall or something like that. And that, that would be the way that we have come to approach truth right now. So not, a, not a, a necessarily an accurate depiction of full disclosure of what the truth is. Um, it's just simply uh, ignorance is bliss kind of thing. Uh, so we want to just kind of go on without addressing what's right there in front of us. But today, we're going to address what's right there in front of us. But to do that, I want to, I want to introduce this with like a story. So there, there's, these, there's an old uh, illustration uh, that we're going to kind of rewrite and use for our purposes today. And that's a, about these, these three guys that are all blind. And they're in this room. The elephant's brought into the room where these three blind guys are. And they they don't have they don't have sight, they don't have uh, apparently they don't have smell or taste uh, or e hearing either, but they they have feeling. So the 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 blind guys go up and they start to examine the elephant that's in the room, and upon examination, the one grabs hold of the leg feels the leg of this of this gigantic animal this this is like this this what is this this is like a tree a tree trunk that's what this is this is like a tree trunk another one grabs hold of the ear starts to starts to feel the the size and the shape of the ear and says no no this is more like a fan and then another one grabs hold of the trunk, starts to feel around the trunk. Oh, no, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. This thing is like a snake. And three completely different perspectives of the same creature, the elephant in the room. And the reason why we don't want to talk about the truth that's right in front of us is because a lot of times we come with a different perspective about what that truth is or how it's to be understood. But there's some things that we should know about that illustration, some, some shortcomings of it when it applies to us, and especially with regard to how we approach the world from a religious vantage point. So say uh, with, with our regard, I, I started this whole conversation from a Christian perspective, from a biblical worldview, but not everyone shares that. The, uh, the, um, The Muslims have one particular view of the world. The uh, Jews have an, another perspective of the world. Christians have one. Buddhists have one. So on down the line. All these different religions have what they claim to be the truth. Uh, and I'm not willing to, to give up the truth that I've come to understand and, and acknowledge, and I want to share with you why. Okay, so... The, the truth, uh, the problem with this illustration of the elephant in the room and, and the three different perspectives is that we, we, I started this by saying they're all blind. They apparently have no other senses upon which to rely upon. The smell, the, the uh, uh, taste, not, not that you want to go licking an elephant, uh, hearing of what that sounds like, um, and no pr prior exposure to an elephant, so nothing to compare it with other than apparently they knew what a snake was, a tree was, and a fan was. But they had never experienced an elephant. And so one of the first things, shortcomings of this illustration that we have to acknowledge is that they were blind. And as a result of their blindness, they couldn't see. But there was one person who saw it all. And that's the person who tells it. That was be me, you know, seeing, seeing, and relating to the experiences going on from all all the different vantage points as others experience it. So in in this illustration, we see that they each had a partial. They get partial credit for what they were able to discover in terms of how it resembled something else that they knew. But each one had an 
imperfect experience. Now, if we relied only upon our own experiences, we would have this same problem. Our perspective would be very limited. And, you know, if we had never met an elephant or seen an elephant or heard an elephant, smelled an elephant or tasted an elephant, we would have very little to compare it with. And so we'd rely on other things like the, the tree and the fan and, and the snake. But the, the fact is we have seen. And more than that, we don't rely only upon our own personal experiences, but the others' experiences that people have had that have come before us. And that's where we, we rely upon, like, the testimony of God's word. And the fact that that word has been studied, archaeological discoveries have lent to its credibility. Historically, this is one of the Bible is one of the most inspected books of all time and continues to be verified over and over again. As they discover archaeological evidence, the places that people have talked about in the Bible are discovered, and that just, once again, reaffirms that this word is, is true. And not only do we see the evidence that of the faithfulness of the historicity of the word, but then we see that its principles and its values bear forth merit in our lives. You know, if we... If we take and apply them they work they work and so there's great things there but not only that it knowing the history of what has taken place tells us also a little bit about the future of what will take place and so we can begin to trust what has happened because we can see its trustworthiness toward what is yet to come now the second thing that we might have problem with is that with regard to this, it, it suggests that a person can never change their vantage point. So the three blind people that inspected those different parts never moved around the elephant to feel anything else that they could examine. So the person that held the ear never tested the size of the, the leg or, or felt the trunk. And that's not the case. In fact, what we see w with regard to the truth that that we're searching for and that we discover in God's word is that many people have, have gone through this themselves. They start out from a particular background. Maybe they, they've started out uh, as a Muslim and then have never experienced the love of Christ until a disciple of Christ demonstrates that love and begins to share with them uh, why they love. We love because God first loved us. And shares with them the freedom that they can have from the sin and guilt and the burden of the law that it places on us in, in, the, in the knowledge of the gospel and that Christ has fulfilled that law for us. And then that, that Muslim believes in Christ and their vantage point has expanded and changed. And so people, like all of the... All of the uh, apostles. We often divide Jews and, and uh, Gentiles, and, and then we put Christians somewhere in the middle there. But those Jews became Christians as they were called to follow Christ. I will make you fishers of men. And, and that, that those Jewish fishermen began to follow Jesus, the, the Messiah, and trusted in him and became his apostles. And so they went from Jew to Christian, you know, as believers, that was kind of a straight line because that's what they were waiting for. And that's what they found, the truth revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And so there is a change of vantage point. We aren't necessarily stuck to where we were, and that's another shortcoming of this. Uh, the third shortcoming is that we stop with, in this illustration, that this, as we talk about the elephant in the room, is that that truth is the only truth. And that you have, uh, you have all rights to that truth. You, you own that truth. And so uh, that truth is never put into the context of anything else. So a way to look at that would be that, that these different religions contain truth there's some uh, like confucianism there's some really 
wise things that Confucius shares. But in, in totality, I would follow Jesus before Confucius. Confucius doesn't offer me what Jesus offers me in truth. Okay, He does offer me some, some wise sayings that are, are worth taking note of. But there's limits to Confucius that aren't with Christ. Uh, the same thing is true for all these other uh, religions as well, that they, they have some truth to them. It's like a, a kind of a bad joke in a way. You, you got a, a, a Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian. And the, and the Jew believes that Jesus was a rabbi, a, a teacher, the Muslim believes that Jesus was a prophet, and the Christian believes that he is the Savior. Now, the, the Jew that believes that Jesus was a rabbi is right. A absolutely. He was a rabbi. He was a teacher, and that's what they, they called him. Uh, he was a prophet, and the Muslims are right regarding Jesus, that he was a prophet. So uh, praise the Lord that they would acknowledge that. But if they stop there, the Jew fails to see the prophetic office that Jesus possesses, and the Muslim fails to see the teaching attributes of Jesus, and both fail to see the fact that he came to teach them and to share with them the word of God so as to lead them to salvation through faith in him. And so uh, the, to, to think that you have to hold a position that you cannot uh, include other positions. Like I can, from, from a, a Jewish perspective, believe that Jesus is a teacher. But as I come to know him as a teacher, I may want to know more. <laughs> I do want to know more uh, about him and the other attributes and offices that he possesses. So keep that in mind. And when we talk about the, the, the truth that some... You know, you don't talk about what religion and politics. You talk about weather and sports. Um, but today we're talking about religion in the world. And the elephant in the room is that the, the truth is intended to be known. God wants us to know the truth. That's why. That's why he sent Jesus. That's what he teaches about as rabbi. That what, that's what he prophesies about as prophet. And he saves us from the lies and deceitfulness of the devil who brought us out of that paradise and as a result of following his lies wound up being in this fallen context of a world. So I want to lead you through a few uh, through scripture readings today. All right, the first one is from uh, Psalm 25, verse 5. Psalm 25, verse 5. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. So this is what the Jews were waiting for, right? They were praying, lead me in your truth. You are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. That's the Messiah. That's the Savior. And that's the one who has come. So if that's been your prayer then today is the day of your salvation. And what who, the person, if you're Jewish watching the, this, the person that you've been looking for, that you've been praying for, the God that, that you need to save you has come, and he's waiting for you to trust in him. He's calling to you to trust him. Today is the day of your salvation. Uh, and, and so this psalm was received by, uh, by those Jews that, that uh, like Peter and Andrew, James and John, they prayed this prayer. They, they waited for this Messiah. Here's another scripture reading. Sanctify, this is Jesus actually talking. Uh, this is a, his high priestly prayer that he prayed uh, for, for us. Uh, sanctify them in in the truth, your word is truth, from John 17, 17. And so he's talking about sanctification. is make them holy 
through this truth. What is the truth that, that is able to make us holy? And that's his word, okay? That his word is truth. So there we find uh, our, our source of holiness. Here's another one. You search the scriptures, okay? Your word is truth. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. And that is truth. Okay, so we search the scriptures because there's, there's where we're made holy. That's where we're sanctified. Uh, and that's where we find the source of our eternal life. And the scriptures all point to Jesus. In the Old Testament, they pointed to him coming. In the New Testament, they tell of him who came. And we continue to look at the scriptures and the authority of this word that is able to sanctify us. Okay? Uh, here's another scripture passage from John 14, verse 6. Here Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples, and he's, he's uh, teaching them at the Passover dinner. And he says to them at one point, kind of like the, the bridegroom and the church as the bride, Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so that's the, that's the source of life that we search the scriptures for. That's the way that the psalmist prayed for. And the only way that we can get there is if we trust the truth, not our own truth, not our personal truth, not a portion of the truth, not a little tiny piece of truth. We're not going to trust in the truth of a, of a tree trunk that is really an elephant. We're going to examine the scriptures in their totality to put the, the whole world in the context that, that we currently reside and have God lead us from where we are to where he wants us to be. There's no other way. That's the truth. That's the elephant in the room is the reality. There is no other way than Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. St. Paul uh, wrote this uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in his letter to the Corinthian church. And in this letter, he, he was, this is, uh, chapter 15 is what we call the resurrection chapter. It's where he really puts it all on the line with regard to the work that Jesus has accomplished and done for us, for our benefit and for our eternal salvation. You know, this is where we see, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, death, grave, is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The, uh, the victory is the law. Here it is. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the way. This is the way. All right, so in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he puts it all on the line. He said, what, what if? What if? Uh, here, I'm going to blow this up to big screen here so you get the full quote. If Christ has been raised, if Christ has not been raised, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Okay, if this is not the truth, then we are seriously stuck then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. You know that, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whosoever believes in him, that's Jew, that's Muslim, that's Confucian, Confucius, that's Buddha, that's the whole works. Whoever believes in Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, shall not perish but have eternal life. But if he has not raised, been raised from the dead, then we are seriously stuck and those that have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. But Paul went on from there. Now let's get the, the bigger context. He went on in the verse 19, he says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. What a, what, you, you're pathetic. You're, you're pathetic. If all you have is hope, think of what you could be doing. 
if you were not following Christ, you know, what, what could you, how could you spend your time? What would Sunday morning be look like? I mean, what would Sunday morning look like if you weren't following Christ? You'd be doing whatever. Didn't matter. You wouldn't have to spend time worshiping. Why would you worship someone who didn't exist, right? And, and what a pity. Uh, look at all the, the wealth that's spent. What a pity. What a shame. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, let me assure you, Paul did not stop writing there. He didn't put an amen at the end of that. But in fact, he goes on, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And that's the hope, that's the confidence, that's the truth that we have, is that we're not to be pitied, we're to be joined. If you want salvation, you find it nowhere else other than Jesus Christ. That's where salvation is found, that's the truth. You want the elephant in the room that sometimes we don't want to talk to because we're afraid that we might offend someone? You get the full picture, is Jesus is the only way, the truth, the life. And there is no other access. There's no way to get there. You can't be good enough to earn your way into heaven. I can assure you, you'll never be gooder than Jesus. That's right. I said it. You'll never be gooder than Jesus. So, an unbeliever and a believer come before the mercy seat or the judgment seat of Christ. One walks away declared innocent. The other remains in guilt. One goes to eternal salvation and heaven. The other to hell and everlasting damnation. Today, I guess for each of us, is either the day of salvation or the day of judgment. What truth do you believe? Well, let's... Uh, let's commend ourselves to, to God in this way, that we that he guides us into his truth and that he sanctifies us with his truth and he confirms his truth in us through his, the reading of his, his word. Let's pray. God, I, I do, I thank you and praise you for your word that we're able to read, to hear, uh, to to digest, you know, to consume, uh, to understand that it is able to lead us in a greater understanding, to inform us of ways that are much higher than ours, thoughts much greater than ours, and puts us into a context in which we have only a limited perspective, but then begins to show us the big picture. Thank you for your truth. Continue to guide us in this truth. Help us to be vehicles and messengers of your truth. And, and God, make us bold so as not to be so timid as to not to talk about the elephant in the room. But as those who are blind, who have now received sight, help us to share what we have seen through your word, what we have witnessed in our lives, and what we have experienced by your grace with those who are still poor, wretched, and blind. We pray this in, for the sake of our for the, the sake of our household, our oikos, our family, our friends, our neighbors, and this world. Help us, Lord. Help them, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right. Well, it was it has been a blessing to once again share this screen with you and have the opportunity to. Uh, to pray with you, to study God's word together, to enjoy the confidence that we can have and to live in his truth. And so let me just send you with God's peace, all right? Peace be with you. Have a great day in the Lord. Take care.